So now we're moving in to unit four. Now, the pace of things are gonna change here a bit. Okay, up till now, I've kind of covered what I consider the core foundation of OpenMP. And you can go off, stop now, go off and do most, most of what people do with OpenMP, you can do. But there's a little bit more that you really should probably understand. And so I call this unit the, a few advanced topics in OpenMP. A lot of people can ignore this, but you know, to really get the most out of OpenMP and understand where it's going in the future, probably a good idea to hang with me for a little bit longer. But so we're, now we're gonna go into some more advanced topics in OpenMP. And the starting place I already hinted at before, because you know that linked list exercise we went through? Oh my God, could you imagine doing serious programming with that kind of pass through the list once to figure out how long it is, pass through the list again to collect the pointers, pass through the list again to do it in parallel? Forget it, that's just wretched. There's gotta be a better way. And there is, and it was actually a very time consuming, difficult piece of work to get this into OpenMP. It took us eight years of work to get this in. So it's gonna be easy for me to present, but I want you to understand this was not easy to get into OpenMP. The idea is tasks. Now, a task is a general concept. It appears in parallel programming languages all over the place, but in OpenMP, you just think of it as an independent unit of work. And we have this nice cute little picture here that kind of summarizes it. And you just wanna take those units of work put them into some kind of task queue or some kind of queued up construct and just have the system implement them and run them when they can, hopefully together. So a task consists of some code to execute. It consists of the data environment that carried with that task. And it consists of internal control variables that control that environment. Eh, it's a new concept I've thrown at you, so I better explain it. In OpenMP, there are certain features of the environment that constructs control, like, for example, the default number of threads. If I have parallel, pragma OMP parallel, and that's it, it's going to create a number of threads. How many threads is it going to create? Well, I don't know. Did I tell it how many threads to create? Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. How does it keep track of how many threads to create by default? That's an internal control variable. There's an internal control variable, it's opaque, you can never see it directly, but it keeps track of what's the default number of threads. Okay, so there's, there's a number of these internal control variables that control the behavior of the OpenMP program. These are the things you manipulate with the runtime library routines, OMP set num threads. Okay, that sets the internal control variable for the default number of threads. OMP get num threads, okay, that, queries the internal control variable and returns what its value is. So there's a whole number of them and most of them have this OMP set library routine, OMP get library routine. So what I'm telling you is the binding of internal control variables happens not to a thread but to a task. And this is one of the difficult subtleties we had to work through the language to figure out how to get tasks totally integrated into OpenMP. So let me continue. So you create a bunch of tasks, and the system may run the tasks right away, but it may defer them to run them later on. And, and I like to think of it as you have some kind of queue mechanism that stores up the tasks until available threads are there to run them, and then they'll pick up a task and run them and schedule them. All right, let's look at some examples. Okay, so you're gonna have a task construct, which defines a task. And so here we have a piece of code where I have I have to create threads. Remember, OpenMP, you never get threads without a parallel construct. So here I have a pragma OMP parallel that's gonna create a parallel construct. So I've got a team of threads. So now I have a pragma OMP task. Each and every thread in the team is gonna see that pragma OMP task. Remember, I haven't changed how basic OpenMP works. And so what it's telling them is the following structured block, which in this case creates just, is, contains just one line, the following structured block is turned into a task. So each thread is gonna create a task, and that task will be called foo. Okay, it'll call the function foo. Now, what OpenMP says is all the tasks I've created are guaranteed to complete at the following barrier. So we're gonna create a task, one per thread, 
Those tasks will sit on a queue and execute, or each thread will execute them directly. You don't care. You think of the tasks as being created. They go out there. They execute. And when you get to the barrier, no one goes beyond the barrier until all the tasks are complete. All right? Now, the next construct is really, really common. Okay? In this case, I'm having just one thread create the task. So I have pragma OMP single. So one thread creates that task. And then I have pragma OMP task, which is going to be called bar. And that function bar, the structured block following the task construct, but in this case, it's one line is all there is to the structured block. So it's going to create that, function, that task to execute that function. Once again, there's a barrier at the end of that single because I didn't use no wait. So everyone's going to wait until the tasks are done before they continue. So that's the task construct. Now let me say a little bit more about how the data works. Now here's a program. I'm going to have a, and this is a very common pattern. It's called the divide and conquer pattern. So what I have is I'm going to do a Fibonacci sequence. By the way, this is a terrible way to actually do a Fibonacci sequence if you care about Fibonacci sequences. But, but we just want a simple example that actually does a well-defined operation. So yes, don't, don't, don't get on my case for, for ugly Fibonacci sequence solvers. You know, this is just a simple way to show the divide and conquer pattern. So here I have a function called fib. It's going to have to be called, if it's going to do anything in parallel, it's going to have to be called by uh, a routine that has a parallel region already. So assuming it's called by a it's by, uh, uh, it within a parallel region, we come inside this function. I declare some variables on the stack, x and y, they're private. If the n passed in as an argument to the function is less than 2, I immediately return n. The Fibonacci sequence of 1, the Fibonacci sequence of 0, just returns that value. Okay? Otherwise, I'm going to create a task to do the Fibonacci sequence of n minus 1. And I'll create another task to do the Fibonacci sequence of n minus 2. Then I'm going to have task wait. Now what that's going to say is, I want to wait until those two tasks are done, then I'm going to add the results together. Are you with me? Can you see that? So I've created two tasks, and then I'm going to wait, and then I'm going to put them together. Now this is recursive, right? So I'm calling the function fib. Inside, I'm going to call the function fib again, which is going to create two more tasks. And each one of those tasks is going to call fib. And each one of those is going to create two more tasks. So I'm going to get this recursive tree of all these tasks. And then as they compute at the leaves, they'll work their way up and they will complete. Now there's one problem with this program. What about x and y? If the x and y are private to the task, the data environment is bound to the task. What do you think is going to happen when I try and return x plus y? I hope, I hope at least a few of you said that, well, when you go out of scope, the private variables go away, so this program won't work. And it won't because of that reason. The private variables of the tasks are undefined outside the task, so how do you think I fix it? I think a lot of you, I hope, I hope a lot of you got this. If I put shared, so now the x and the y, when the task is done, they don't go out of scope, so that return x, y in the code will still work. You got that? So look at this whole code up here. We've got the Fibonacci sequence, which is going to recursively create this tree of tasks. Then as they compute at the leaves, they're going to fold back up to give me the final sequence value. And I had to make the x and the y shared so they would be picked up and visible at once the task was done. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the data scoping with, with uh, tasks. Here's another example. So here I'm going to have an example where I'm going to walk through a list, and I have a shared value of this list, all right? So I'm going to go through there, and I'm going to walk through. And what's wrong with this code? I'm going to have a data race, because I have a shared variable E, all right? The shared variable E, and that means each task is going to be stomping on that shared variable, and they can get in each other's way. So how do I fix it? How about I put a first private right there? So now, as I capture each task, as I create each task, it's going to look at the value of E at that point. It's going to create a private variable for that value E of that pointer, and it's going to initialize it to that pointer, so now the task will execute on its own copy of that pointer. All right? This is so common that by default, a private variable will be made first private. I've given you a quick rundown of tasks. Believe it or not, I've given you enough information so you can go back to that exercise, linked.c, 
and you can create the parallel version of it using tasks. Go for it, and we'll talk about it in a little while.